Hello and welcome to this third installment of the WAC lecture series. We have a very special guest this evening, uh, Mr. Brendan Hurd, who is the editor-in-chief of Aureus Press and also the author of The Decline and Fall of Western Art and also The Dream God, which is his science fiction book. So this evening he's going to be discussing uh, the idea of what is Western art, which is actually part of his book, The Decline and Fall of Western Art. So, Brendan, thank you for being here. And uh, with that, I will go ahead and give you the floor. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, you introduced me pretty good there. Um, I, yes, I am a I won't say, I don't like to call myself an artist because I don't trust people who call themselves artists, but I, I am a creative person, let's say. So I went to art school and I have been working in the art world for decades, let's say. And I thought to myself, this is a, a load of shit. And the school was really ridiculous. And I knew it at the time. And being naively thrust into the world as I was, I developed my own ideas I had to keep them quiet for a while, but I had ideas forming about this. Something was terribly wrong here. And it wasn't until later on when I became introduced to other people who have thought about this and spoken about it that I realized that it really was a tremendous joke and a bit of a sham and a scam. And so I wrote my book about contemporary art and uh, the reasons for why I thought it was failing and uh, against art, anti-art. And uh, involved in that, in this, I think the first three chapters was, I tackled the subject of what is Western art. So Jeff approached me with this idea that I should give a lecture on what is Western art. Um, so it's a, anytime anybody tries to, if you ask yourself or ask anybody else, what is art at all? It's almost an impossible question to answer. And uh, people have known this, and it's a it's a popular question amongst in certain circles, let's say. But it really is almost impossible to answer. But I mean, if anybody's qualified to try, living, I mean, it's surely me. And in terms of what is Western art, there is a fairly specific series of things we can look at that are very broad. I do have to bring up a lot of different things here to really do it justice. And so you'll have to forgive me. I'll have to go back and forth between like history and a bit of math and specific things. But let's say if, if you were to be, if someone asks you, what is, what is Western art? Um, you have to typically think of what comes to most people's minds symbolically that is the Western art that people flock to as tourists. And, you know, people think of themselves and want to see, which is really for the most part, classical art, cla the art of classical antiquity, not exclusively, because all art is cross-fertilizing and expanding. It's like an evolving life form. It always, it's always changing and uh, being influenced by other arts around it. But the core values of what we consider Western art would be in uh, the classical values. So you have to think about those and discover those and understand what they are. So if I... If I was to say, if someone asked me what is art, I'm not even going to try to address that broadly because it's ridiculous, but I, I know what it isn't. And I know that the popular contemporary uh, art scholars do have an answer. They claim to have an answer for that. And they say it's personal expression. And this is part of their trick really for destroying art because personal expression is only a small piece of what really constitutes proper traditional art, traditional uh, Western or classical art. Uh, they zoom in, like they do, have done since, and many other destructive ideas they have, they zoom in on a, on a small function, a piece of the wider picture and ignore everything else. And they blow up this one piece and they make it the all all encompassing reason for the whole thing. But really on its own, just personal expression is not even one of the, a larger part, part of proper art. Proper art in the historical sense, is it has cultural confidence it is idealizing certainly in the classical sense 
it, it is about self-improvement and it complements nature. It loves nature and wants to accentuate nature, but it is also unafraid to exact its will upon the world. So all that is gone now from our contemporary view of what we consider art. That's the victory of the anti-Western media and the hijacking of education and of the it, industrialization itself, I don't believe is to blame. I believe the hijacking of industrialization by the mercantile class is to blame. And really, traditionally, let me just, I like to, I'm going to make little notes here on the sketch pad and put them in front of the camera. To traditional society, the classes were broken up into the warrior class. Can you see that? I like to do it while I'm running, but the warrior class, the priestly class, and then the mercantile class. Actually, before the mercantile class were the artisans, which are the artists. So the merchants were at the bottom in a proper organized historical society of the type that I'm going to review. And now they are on the top. They are on the top and they control everything. And art does not flourish or even function at all in a society run by its merchant class, which as we can see is dysfunctional in all kinds of ways and will probably have a partial or full collapse <laughs> because we can't seem to get out from under them. But this is apart from what I'm here to talk about. That's a whole other lecture, really. So, uh, fine art, fine art, which is really at least heavily influenced by the values of classical art, was once the crown jewel of civilization. So fans, fans of true fine art really are fans of civilization, let's say. And civilization itself has many values and mores which come out of ancient history that are uh, antithetical to certain value, to values we would have now, which have sort of transformed them into these weak mawkish things that don't make any sense. But um, back then, back in a proper functioning society, your art, fine art, and even your folk art is enmeshed or entwined with your science and your religion. And it's one as sort of a whole, it's a cultural whole that isn't contradictory and complements each other. And they all proceed together with a kind of cultural confidence where now we're completely broken up. These things are fractured and they don't complement each other. They're at war with each other and there's no confidence to carry on. Uh, there's no belief in ourselves. And art today really is just a money laundering racket as far as I can see. Um, and part of that is they destroyed the, um, the industrialization, not just industrialization, but the rapid rate of change in industrialization in, in commercial industrialization, industrialization that was instead of used just for like heroic purposes, like space travel and amazing inventions was just to make like faster assembly lines for more products let's say, that destroyed the master apprentice system, which was really the core workings of a more traditional artistic uh, interwoven society. Like for instance, say, even uh, it, in the larger sense, it was guilds, craft guilds. And so, you know, when industrialization to, began, began its rapid, rapid changes, let's say there was a blacksmith guild for just shoemakers, for horses. Obviously, when cars came along, that whole thing, they were all gone. So these rapid changes, successive changes, kind of tr transformed guilds into corporations. And so say, like Mozart was uh, an apprentice to, I believe, Hayden. I'm pretty sure that's right. I hope that's right. There was a master apprentice system that skills were learned and handed down. And your skills were based on whatever your master was, whoever your master was. And in the changes and, fl and evolutions in art that occurred, the cross-pollination from other influences, because in all art and all creative ventures and art uh, occur because you have something and it becomes influenced by something else and that changes it slightly. Two things combine generally, at least two, into something new that are as recognizable as both, but then in, this, is, this is evolution, this is life and how everything changes. And I'll get into that more later. That's, there's mathematical reasons for that. Um, but so, yes. What that industrialization killed that system, which and leaves us with a 
kind of a ghost of a of a functionality for art where we have these assembly line objects and items that are now totally artless almost completely useless but they're fulfilling kind of ghostly routine of something we felt we need and wanted for all those years that aren't even made by us and they're largely meaningless but that's really talking again about our downfall so in terms of what is western art so we have to begin with a bit of history here let's say so I think the best thing, let me just start with a quote. Since I'm talking about cl uh, classical antiquity, I'm going to start with a little quote from Plato. For he who would proceed correctly should begin in use to visit beautiful forms. For out of that he should create fair thoughts. And soon he will himself perceive that the beauty of one form is akin to the beauty of another. And that beauty in every form is one and the same. So that's Plato. Now, in terms of Europe. So if we're talking about Western art, we're talking about Europe. A digital sketch of Europe. Not a great sketch of Europe. So. Europe. <laughs> 10,000 years ago, we're going to go back 10,000 years. That's right. 10,000 years ago, the Ice Age retreated. Europe was mostly, I believe, Cro-Magnons, who, while sort of beastly creatures, were actually quite intelligent and is, exist today, interbred with sort of Nordics and um, UK. I forgot to draw on the UK and Ireland, which I should have over here somewhere. There's Spain. Uh, Spain. There's Italy. Yeah. I'll do a little UK there. What's the shape of it? It's got a weird shape. Whatever. There's UK in that. So, the, uh, when the Ice Age retreated, the Cro-Magnons all moved north, chasing the mammoths that they were used to hunting, and the Mediterranean white people uh, flourished, and these were the, the uh, megalithic people that began farming, the megalithic uh, farming uh, change of 10,000 years ago. That took over Europe, so they became farmers. They um, they continued that for a while, and there was other migrations of people, and these were the people that built the amazing passage tombs and the large uh, monolithic stone constructions that we pretty much couldn't even do today. Hey, However, they did hey, them. Brent, Brendan, yeah. your your camera kind of like tilted down. I think you accidentally oh. knocked it. Right. Tilted up a little bit, so we see. There you go. It's too high there. Is that All right? Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. What was I saying? Oh yeah. So they built all the uh, things like Newgrange in Ireland. Things like Newgrange in Ireland were built by these people. Uh, Newgrange was built about five thousand BC. So ten thousand BC, the snow started to melt. Five thousand by five thousand BC, Newgrange was built. Older than the pyramids. Enormous stone structure. Um, those people were. These people had were not. They didn't have a written language, so everything, these are our ancestors, our people. Um, they, so everything was oral tradition. Everything was passed down, uh, just remembered. You, Any stories, folk tales, myths, religion, uh, knowledge was passed down orally. But they were tremendous builders, and all their buildings were often related to cosmography. It was, they were very concerned with looking at the stars and being in conjunction with the seasons and the the uh, movement of the planets and so forth and they had a great awareness of this these were not uh savage idiots um yeah so they were there and then horses were domesticated around 4000 bc so another thousand years later and around that time from up here in the russian steppes the indo-europeans came and they came riding in on their chariots and things and they were very warlike, and they had many interesting ideas about sky fathers and other gods, and many habits that are still with us today and really are the source of many of our traditions. So really, in the aristocratic sense, these are the people who are the wellspring of many of our ideas and beliefs and our general carry-on. <laughs> they not only conquered Europe, they conquered Asia, they went as far as India, they came down over here, and most important, importantly, they got involved. Initially, they conquered Egypt at one point. There's talk that they conquered Sumeria. Um, it's not verified because, and the Sumerians referred to themselves as, uh, referred to themselves, I believe, as dark haired people. But there seems to be a lot of just possibility and similarities. They also had chariot warrior type um, war warfare and things. So I've heard speculation that they were also conquered by them at one point. But, anyways. 
you see Sumeria comes back into this uh, shortly, and you'll see the point of all my history lesson. So, for, so we had 10,000 BC, the snow melts. 5,000 BC, we get things like the things like Newgrange and the the megalithic structures and the farming. By uh, 4,000 BC, we've got the Indo-European migration and horses and chariots. And around 3,200 in Sumeria, which I was just talking about, they invented writing. And writing, yes, was very important. And this really is the crux of why I'm talking today about the ancient Greeks and not the Celts or the, the Nordics in terms of art. Not that I won't be talking about them as well, but um, writing cut on there, obviously in Mesopotamia, etc., and eventually in Egypt. It was really a matter more of record keeping and uh, admin kind of stuff. That wasn't till, it wasn't really till I think the Greeks, not not strictly so, but when it really took off as a like form of um, other expression. Uh, I had a quote here from Sumerian. Where is it? Yes, first known story of the invention of writing. And this is a little uh, Sumerian quotation. Because the messenger's mouth was heavy and he couldn't repeat the message, the Lord of Kulaba patted some clay and put words on it like a tablet. Until then, there had been no putting words on clay. That's a Sumerian epic poem, Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata from 1800 BC. So that's just an account of, of writing. So the Proto-Indo-Europeans that conquered all of Europe, all of our languages, major languages derived from them. That's Latin, Germanic, Celtic, and Slavic. So they conquered all these places in Europe, as well as India and others, then sort of because of great distances, lost contact with each other, and their origin languages developed into Celtic and Latin and so forth. So it all comes from that source. Um, the reason why classical Greece gets special mention in terms not just of art, but of creativity and I think the original high culture in Europe is that for whatever reason, the, well, obviously it was actually when the Greek empire emerged, they had a tremendous influence from Egypt, which was, and Persia, which was closer to places like Sumeria where writing had caught on and they kept records. But the Greeks began to keep records and to write and to pass on knowledge uh, where everyone else was still practicing oral tradition. Even the Vikings who had the Futhark written language were generally an oral culture still and the celts didn't, didn't really have a written language so much as far as i know i mean there's the uh Agum, but i believe that's early medieval so um that's that's why greece rose to preeminence early is the combination of being descended from this um uh, indo-european culture and in fact you can see it very much in things like the iliad which is all about chariot war and you know blonde haired warriors like achilles and which is the root of Hellenism really is the Iliad and Homer, which the Iliad was. The events of the Iliad supposedly took place around 1000 BC on our timeline. So that's much closer. I think the last one I mentioned was 3000 BC was the invention of writing. So 10,000 BC, ice melts. 5,000, there's the megaliths. 4,000, there's the horsemen. 3,000, we have writing. By 1,000, we have the events of the Iliad. And by 800, Homer has written them down. And that's the first... Uh, major literary, let's say, Indo-European work. Maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't say that exactly. But anyways, it's a major one. So that is why we focus on Greece and later Rome in terms of art. Now, let's see what about you. Uh, so the classical age of Greece begins around 500 BC. So Homer writes, writes his works in 800 BC. So by 500 BC is when we start to get Pythagoras. And um, uh, Polycletus, who, who I'm going to be talking about, and everybody, <laughs> everybody worth talking about, including uh, Alexander the Great. So that's the first great age of Greece, is uh, Alexander and his conquest of the East, not so much Europe, but East words. And again, the link with Egypt, where he pronounced himself the son of uh, Amun-Ra, and founded the city of Alexandria, which famously had then the Library of Alexandria, which shows the uh, Greek and inherently Western um, the values of knowledge, gather knowledge gathering, categorizing, just like learning truth about truth above at all cost, not just like 
to be on, but to be have balance. The balance is something I'm going to bring up a lot in reference to art as a Greek value, and everything has to be harmonious and balanced. But they really um, are the great accumulators of knowledge, the first ones, and really possibly the best ever, considering how much how creative their society was. And it's not just in terms of art values that I'm going to be talking about that they granted us. There's the philosophy. I mean, science itself. You know, theater. Not just, there's the sculpture, the architecture, geometry. I mean, they they excelled, and there's all these things you can think of, and there'll be like a a term, a scientific term for it in the background, which if you investigate, will be very interesting, and it'll be a, an idea invented by some crazy Greek guy in 500 BC. So whatever was going on, they just had a creative burst that I think it was pretty much unparalleled. And when I think of Rome, Rome enters this picture around 400 BC. They're really just, they grow and grow and grow, and they last until about 1300, 1350 AD is the fall of the Eastern Empire. Is it 13? I'm saying, is it 14? Oh, I can't remember. I think I have it here somewhere. 1450, sorry. 1450 AD, the Eastern Empire falls. And like shortly thereafter, all the books that were there make their way to Florence. And then we have the Renaissance, which is the second coming of these classical ideas, which influenced all of the West again. And took over everything and only have only just recently died or fallen out of preeminence and been suppressed somewhat so um it was there's a two-stage classical takeover of europe let's say of these uh creative values which i think are the core values of that we need to return to and keep in mind because even though everything is evolution and change in life evolution is like branches of a tree a growing tree they spread out sort of randomly you know, the way they grow, they go up and they go out and little branches go in different directions. And in different spots, you get variations, even though they might have the same root. And that is a fractal expansion, which is along the lines of the math I'll be bringing up involved here. I know as an art student, you're not dying to hear about math, but really the core of this art, this Western art is in math. Um, that's nothing like formulas you don't have to calculate. Well, maybe you probably should if you're trying to do it properly. But um, yeah, that's evolution, evolution of idea, evolution in life, of actual life, and evolution of ideas, creative ideas. They it all they all work in the same way. The way they branch out and try to live and influence influence each other. But it's like the fractal expansion that goes on behind the scenes in creation. Let's say so. Uh, they say the Iliad was also possibly derived from an Indo-Aryan myth that it's very similar to a story that exists in India and in the Celt, there's a Celtic version, but I don't know. It sounds like a really fairly literal account and there's supposedly an event around 1000 BC that's based on. Um, so this obsession with literature really gave the classical world of the Greeks and then later the Romans a step up above I would say the Celts and, and even the Vikings. And then they would admit that themselves. There's plenty of accounts of back in the day of, you know, Danes in England coming across Roman statues or ruins and just like who made these giants or, you know, gods. <laughs> and like it was, it was, has always been impressive to everybody. Um, yeah. So that's the oral tradition versus the written tradition, the importance of record keeping and of writing and of remembering things and passing things on. Even though now we're entering a stage where people are reading less um, and we're almost back to an oral tradition. Here I am talking to you instead of like, you're not reading my book. Uh, hopefully you do, but you're not. So maybe we're going to switch back weirdly to an oral tradition uh, somehow. But anyways, uh, yeah, they had, they worshiped the, they didn't worship, they excelled at keeping records and writing things down. And all those Greeks were, uh, many of them uh, lived and worked or lived or spent long times, long periods of time in, in Egypt. So there was a lot of um, access to the Library of Alexandria and that, which not just had the new knowledge, but it had everything that Egypt had going way back as the oldest civilization for thousands of years. So there's a lot of tradition there. And there was a way to go way back and see things, you know, going really far back and to gather as much knowledge from around the world as they could. Like Pythagoras himself, I think he was in Egypt for 22 years. And I know Plotinus was, uh, grew up there. He was Greek, but he, he was born and raised there as well. Um, so what's my point with all that? What is my point? Can we tell? 
So recording information, instead of just oral tradition, is an improvement on for the people in your bloodline coming ahead of you. Obviously, you have it, and it's it's invaluable to have a written record of things, as, as opposed to some guy, just some asshole, just remembering it and retelling it, you know, and changing it whatever way he wants. <laughs> so respect for knowledge and truth is a cornerstone of Western art and Western traditions, which when I say Western art, and when I speak of it in the classical sense, as I already said, it, that's enmeshed with science and everything. Anyways, it's a cultural thing. It's interwoven, so. Um, uh, da, 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 da. So above, above all, part of the reason the Greeks were so creative, I think, was that they put reason above everything else uh, as all important. And they really did so. It was in their religion. It was like, it's really, in, it's in, certainly in Neoplatonism and in a lot of their beliefs, reason is held to a, as a chief value. So to have reason ab above all as a value means you will have truth as a value as well. So even a painful truth, even when you have to make, you know, that makes you very good at making the tougher of two two bad decisions kind of thing, which were impossible. We can't even begin to do now. It's, this is all lost lost uh, lost knowledge uh, but rationality is important and you wouldn't you don't necessarily associate rationality with creative stuff but this is part of the, this is part of the weird paradoxes of life but uh, it, truly it is and in fact the mathematical there's a mathematical formula for being creative <laughs> as, we, as we'll discuss so it's not really quite as we've been taught the jagoff takes off his pants and flings paint at the campus and says, I'm the artist, you know, that's, he's actually just a Jagoff. So maybe I should talk about the mathematical part of it a little bit. No. Uh, so creative ideas evolve, they evolve in different places. So, and there's the cross-pollination. So we, we, even with the excelling of culture in Greece and Rome, Rome obviously conquered much of Europe, and there was great influence and sort of cross fertilization of ideas, particularly in places like the UK, where like many things came together and mixed, and all over Europe, France, everywhere. I mean, there was the Gauls, there was the various conquests of all the different tribes back and forth for a long time. But in terms of art, um, there was a lot of things influenced each other and created new branches, new growing branches of possibilities. And when you're doing properly creative things, those possibilities, I believe, are infinite. There is a potential for infinite creative growth, which we can also describe mathematically, if we do it correctly. This is uh, what I believe, certainly by following the Greek model, which they had honed to a mathematical perfection. So in the classical definition of art concepts, there is really at the heart of it the golden ratio, which is a mathematical formula which is, what is it now, 1.68? Can't remember now, let me look quick. God, what is it? What is it? Uh, I'll, uh, I'm pretty sure it's 1.68. I'll write that as one. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'll change it there. So, 1.68 dot dot dot. The basic formula for the golden ratio. Also called the golden mean or the golden section. And this was, uh, it was the Pythagoreans who arrived at this early recorded concept of the fundamental nature of numbers. And Hellenists saw numbers as the basis for everything, both physical and metaphysical. So the golden principle, the golden mean, this number, is the root principle in all traditional architecture, painting, sculpture, and music. Pythagoras was actually very obsessed with music and the scales. He would follow the golden ratio and he would be delighted at the result. And anybody who's an artist, this is why you don't necessarily need the math, let's say, to understand patterns because it all it like the like the reaching branches of the tree the creative striving is in patterns like when music and when you're making a song you're laying down patterns a pattern on top of another pattern on top of another following the golden ratio 
ideally, if you want it to be harmonious and sound pleasing. And pleasing doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, just happy. It just means like to create feel, to create the proper feeling, whatever you whatever your intent. Um so patterns of music were Pythagoras' obsession, but there's it's all the patterns in creativity are follow the ratio and are actually um almost better described by the um Fibonacci sequence, which is not actually the golden ratio exactly, but it's pretty much the same thing. They're related and they work together. I'm not sure. I'm not a mathematician, so I don't know. The Fibonacci sequence is, let's see, it's basically on the principle that it starts like 0, 1, 1, and you're always adding the last two. The, la the last two are added together for the next one. So 0 and 1 is 1. Then you go 2, 2 and 1 is 3, 3 and 2 is 5, 5 and 3 is 8, and so forth. So it's infinitely expansive. And it's to do, it's related to fractals. And in the Greek sense, this is how the golden ratio and the sequence show that everything is related, all the parts of a thing, a piece of art or whatever, are related to the whole. And they grow exponentially. So in related to, um, so the golden ratio, say, you've all probably seen the spirals of the golden ratio. For the, for this, these, this formula appears in nature, not just in like, pine cones and things, but in like weird things, like in the breeding, the breeding um, habits of rabbits and stuff, like everything, everything in life follows these weird mathematical sequences. So let's see if I can do this on here. Is the mic okay? Uh, if we want to do a golden rectangle, the idea here is, let's say this is your, this follows the golden ratio. When you remove, if it's ideally so, when you remove this piece and you, take this piece and flip it over on its own, or you don't even have to flip it over. This on its own will be in the golden ratio. So that all the, all the parts equal the sum of the whole. And if you were to continue this there, yeah, that part would be in the golden ratio. That part, that part, that part, that part. And then you follow this mathematically in a spiral. You've all seen the one with Donald Trump's hair. I didn't do a good spiral, sorry. And that is the ratio. It disappears in nature, spirals. It also denotes infinity because the complexity increases exponentially forever, which is encouraging. And um, it really suggests anyways that creativity is has a potential at least for infinite complexity, infinite novelty. And yes. Let's see what else. So Pythagoras considered music and astronomy to relate to scientists. This shows again how everything was linked back then. Uh, geometry was number in space. Music was number in time. Astronomy was number in space and time. So now we should talk uh, maybe about Polyclitus, who, of all the Greek artists, really talked about this quite a bit, even though his book, his book is lost. His major book is called Canon, and he wrote about exactly about this, about applying numbers to art, about, uh, particularly in sculpture. And the Greeks are known for school. When you think of Greeks, you think of sculpture. And how are all the parts are related to the whole in this same way. So that when you're sculpting, if you notice, you notice you see a Greek sculpture and it's wrecked. Half, half the face is gone or whatever. But still, it looks on its own uh, pretty good. <laughs> pretty, you can sense the genius of the whole thing, even a fragment of it. Because each, that's because each piece is built in relation to the whole thing. So like when you see a Greek sculpture and the hand is like this and the finger's out like that, that little digit of the finger is considered in relation mathematically to the whole hand, to the whole arm, and to the whole rest of the body and the position of it. So there's a lot of work in that, obviously. And this is when you have time to consider and worshipfully uh, recreate nature and study things mathematically, <laughs> you can do that. And, uh, you know, it's obviously... Uh, an amazing credit to them once again to their creativity and their intelligence that they can do this. But Polyclitus was around the same time as Phidias, Praxiteles, or more famous. And again, all this ties into the Greek idea of harmony and symmetry. He mentions symmetria, which is like symmetry basically. 
And if, if you read Plato or Aristotle, they'll mention quite a bit the idea of balance and harmony. And even in Aristotle will be talking about ethics or something, and he'll talk be talking about harmony. And it does make a lot of sense that everything, you should seek the harmony in all things, the balance between things. So even ethically speaking, you want to seek in your decision making, lawfully or emotionally, a balance between everything, let's say. And same is in relation to architecture or sculpture or anything, music. You're looking for harmony and balance. And these are the key values in classicism, therefore, in Western art. Um, <clears throat> so Polycletus explained the construction of the ideal human figure using ratios, rhythmic poses, and a system of measure similar to that used in temple building. The canon, which means measure or law, which is now sadly lost, discussed not only ideal proportions for the parts of the human body in relation to one another, but how sculpture of the human figure must achieve dynamic counterbalance between relaxed, intense body parts and the directions in which the parts move. He put these principles into practice in his own sculpture, which he then formed a framework for all ordered European sculpture since the basis of this art is number. Each tiny section of the Hellenic sculpture is created in relation to the rest of the whole in accordance with the golden ratio. The sense of potency, the eternal, lives within them even when the works are damaged or survive in fragments. Okay, I already said that. Uh, Beautiful proportions are found in the same ratios, whether it is in the distance from the chin to the scalp on the human head or the relation of the placement of windows on a building's facade. So these occur in nature. They're there already. And if you want to create something, art, properly, you're going to obey these same laws. This is, what's <laughs> this is what you do. Otherwise, you get this disharmonious art like we have now, which is not art, which is we're, we're working off an improper, uneternal math that's going to keep us in a in a dead end forever if you don't change it up because it's uncreative and it's stultifying and it goes nowhere um, all good proportion follows the beauty form and the subject is interchangeable so here's a quotation about him i'll just read a bit more about polyclitus because he's quite important do we not know the exact details of polyclitus formula the end result is manifested in the Dory Forest, which was the perfect expression of what the Greeks called symmetria. On this sculpture, it shows somewhat of a contraposto contra, contra pose. The body is leaning mostly on the right leg. The Dory Forest has an idealized body, contains less of naturalism. In his left hand, there was a spear, but has since been lost. Posture of the body shows that he is a warrior and a hero. So we see these kind of Indo-European values as well there, uh, as well. But it's very common you see in Greek sculpture that they'd be leaning on a leg and there'd be, there be really make a show of expressing the volume and the mass of the sculpture and the weight properly. It's not, if people think Greek sculpture is perfectly realistic, it's not. It's idealized like you wouldn't believe. And that's where the magic of it comes in. Polycletus is quoted as saying, perfection comes about little, about little by little, paramicron, through many numbers. So, Numbers are the essence. By this he meant the statue should be composed of clearly definable parts, all related to one another through a system of ideal mathematical forces and balance. So that is to say, in the proportions, not of the elements, but of the parts. That is to say, of finger to finger, and all the fingers to the palm of the wrist, and all these to the forearm, and of the forearm to the upper arm, and all to the other parts uh, to each other. The art, art historian... Uh, Kenneth Clark observed that Polyclitus's general aim was clarity, balance, and completeness, his sole medium of communication, the naked body of an athlete standing poised between movement and repose. So art is math. And the golden ratio is at the heart of Western art. And it's so is the Fibonacci sequence. And both of them are related to, curiously, closely related to something called a Mandelbrot, Mandelbrot fractal, which is a fractal pattern which has a boundary of infinite, infinite, infinite growth. So I'm talking again about the branches of the tree that expand forever, the perpetual infinity of novelty. But this is a real mathematical. Mandelbrot was an interesting fellow who, brilliant mathematician, who had some kind of synesthesia thing where when he saw mathematical formulas, he could see them in his head in shapes. He didn't even have to, according to him, he didn't even have to like do the work of the math he would see shapes and he, I think colors or something and see them moving and interacting. Um, and he would be able to figure out formulas just by like visualizing things and really crazy. So he came up with this Mandelbrot fractal, which I'll draw for you quickly here. Hopefully you can see it. 
do do do. This is related to the sequence, the Fibonacci sequence, and the golden ratio. So it's like a weird looking thing. Maybe you've seen them. It's like that. There's one there. And these will fractalize and grow uh, infinitely. There'll be a little bit there. Another one there. And in between all along here, other ones will grow. And they'll, like the branches of the tree, they'll branch out like that. So if you do these by calculation, let's say this one is one and this one is two. Let's say this is two branches. This one is one. Uh, this works in the Fibonacci sense where everything gets added together, where this one here will be, the, um, I believe I'm doing, I hope I'm doing this right, will be the sum of these two, one and two. So this will have three branches of creativity, infinite uh, novelty growing from it. And any one that comes in between here and here, if this is three, will be added to one. So this one will be four. This one will be three and two, five. Sorry for my horrible sketching. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> it doesn't have much to do with exactly what I'm saying other than the idea of creativity and life having a possibly infinite potential. If what they, if what Pythagoras says about, and Polycletus say about number being at the root of things. But that involves this. You can see this in, in art. So if the Fibonacci sequence is, you've got two things, you add them up and you add them to the next thing and you add them to the next. That is, you can see that in like, we can see that even in, so let's say, when I, when I say there was the classical period, there was Alexander's conquest. He brought uh, libraries and gymnasiums to, you know, Bactria and India. And then there was the Roman conquest and he brought the same thing to Europe. And then it died away for a while, came back uh, in the Renaissance. And then say around the last really truly classical art movement was probably Art Deco. Uh, and since then, we set of more pop art movements. Some of them, some of them are good, entirely worthy, but nothing's allowed to live too long in this weird vacuum situation that's only getting worse. But let's say you can see this fractaling combination creativity in something like um, what's a pop art reference? Like um, say rock and roll. Like say when when George Harrison went to India, he came back playing the sitar. No one, you may not ever have guessed that like old timey American rock and roll could be mixed with like Indian. Indian Raga stuff, but then you get, you know, like paint it black and all this stuff and it works. And so you've combined, you've come, you've mixed two things that you, two things that maybe you didn't think could breed together, but they've fertilized one another and made a new thing. You know, maybe this is, this is just a small example, but like there's countless things like that. You could say, you know, classic uh, British heavy metal and punk who are bitter enemies. And rightfully so, I would say, uh, did mix to create arguably thrash metal, let's say, or, you know, there's all kinds of pop art references you can show that's working in the Fibonacci sequence way. The two things make the new thing and then it gets added to another thing and it continues on, maybe infinitely. Um, but I would say what, like I said earlier, we're not living in a, we're not living in a Mandelbrot fractal at the moment. We're not living in a Fibonacci sequence type setup. We're living in a scenario that a scenario of geometry that is not infinite, infinite, is not growing at all. It's not, it's purposely rutted and cut off and it's put together wrongly. Uh, you know, we can ob obviously say intentionally so and, other, and well, both intentionally and unintentionally. And I don't see, unless you, unless there's a third Renaissance, I don't think we'll break out of that naturally because it's very, very forced and very, very um, guarded. So these things are called, these mathematical relations, recursion relations. And they lead to all sorts of amazing patterns. And this, that's all over. It's different creative geometry, geometrical ways for patterns to um, evolve and to change and to grow. Uh, what do I say? 1.618 is the... Uh, is the golden ratio. What did I say? I said point, oh, it said 1.68. It's 1.618. Uh, dot, dot, and like more <laughs> endless numbers. And so, yeah, it's all to do with patterns. Creativity, what happened in Europe, the cross-pollination of ideas and the flows and migrations of people. It's all related to patterns of growth and 
things that influence one another. But that is my extremely com complex and roundabout way of describing to you, as Jeff asked me to do, <laughs> what is Western art, which I'd done in my book much more simply. And actually, when he asked me, I had to go back and thank God, am I still going to agree with everything I said in the book? And I read because it was years ago now, but I did uh, agree that I would have a bit more to say about it now. Um, but yeah, that I mean, that really covers, I think, I feel like I've left something out, but I mean, obviously, we have other events I didn't even include, um, you know, Christianity, let's say, in the timeline, but that was like more of a cross pollinating, another influence that came in mixed with the Greek. There was a lot of big Greek influence in in Christianity again. So that was a whole other thing that, you know, that I don't I don't ascribe to the idea that the, that the Dark Ages were particularly dark, but they weren't great, admittedly, for uh, visual art apart from architecture when they and they actually had Gothic architecture is probably like the best, which is one of these odd outlying phenomena. And they, they had a lot of good stuff. Um, but yeah, in terms of the root values, they're much older than anything found in the Bible, frankly. Uh, like I said, it goes back to, if you're going to give someone credit, it should be people like Pythagoras. And... Um, Here's a quote from Vitruvius, the great Roman architect. Sym symmetry is proper agreement between the numbers of the work itself and the relation between the different parts and the whole general scheme in accordance with the certain parts selected as standard. Well, that's kind of confusing, but he's talking about symmetry <laughs> and numbers and the mathematical relation uh, in proper architecture. Um... And he, I mean, in his day, all the architect, all the amazing architecture of the time was achieved with nothing more than a compass and a stretch cord. He did, but then we're using AutoCAD, and we can't even begin to do things he was doing. But their, it's their it's core root values were in things like this, this emulation of nature, as seen by observing, observing patterns in numbers. Um, so again, I don't want to harp on again about too much it's a whole different lecture on what happened and why we don't why we can't do this anymore and what needs to be done etc but i think that covers what i agreed to cover and what i think is what is western art <laughs> what is important in it and what is important about it and it's right. uh, jeff's back to save me <laughs> hey yeah sorry i was waiting for you to run out of things um that's great, man. No, that's fantastic. And uh, thank you for coming on to do that. Yeah. So basically, symmetry, balance, harmony, these values of classicism are at the core of what makes it Western art, right? And the golden yeah. ratio. I'm going to I'm gonna have to dig more deeply into the golden ratio. Just that, that was a great little um, example there of what you were doing, you know, like splitting it into the different parts. That was a nice visualization of uh, trying to understand that. I'm going to have to... Did you, Sorry. could you understand the uh, Mandelbrot one? Cause that's actually pretty, one of the more interesting. That that's one... an infinite. <laughs> I mean, it's, it looks, it looks, it looks retarded, but. <laughs> that one, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to. You're going to pass on that one, yeah? No, well, I'm going really, to that's... I'll have to revisit to wrap my head around it. That's the thing is I'm going to, I'm going to sit and be like, kind of look at it and, you know, it's, yeah. it's good. I mean, this stuff is very dense, you know, and it's, it's really interesting because actually, even though. You know, I have I studied film in college, and I um, and a lot of music courses. Almost had a minor in music, and I'm pretty sure I never heard the concept of the golden ratio the entire time. You know, I was I was ever in there, which of course we we know well, why. I, didn't, I don't think I heard it in art school at all either. I don't think anybody mentioned it. Um, maybe in passing in like art history, but yeah, I don't think. But I'm sure actually in painting they must have. You know, people know about it, and, and they speak a bit, a lot more casually. Like when I sh when I showed the, uh, you've probably seen the spirals, like the, you know, spirals equal infinity. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. You've seen it in the Donald Trump picture and all that crap. But like mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's a principle used in any anybody who does a painting. Like maybe a modern person who doesn't consider painting properly would just do whatever. But like when you're, it's essential when you're um, outlining the, um, what's the word, composition. Right. You organize your darks and lights and you put your point of focus somewhere. If you've got a rectangular um, um, canvas, that your point of focus should be somewhere around about here. 
and that's to be pleasing to the eye and for the whole thing to work out this is something this is mathematically thing you have to plan and do uh, ph photographers know this generally they just consider keeping their point of focus off center let's say right as a as a rule um right. you know so people understand it very simplistically but they should everyone should try to understand it better i think and <laughs> the greeks certainly tried and and so did the renaissance resurgence uh, artists so, so cool. I'm, I'm looking around here, seeing if we've got any questions. I don't see anything at the moment. I did. We do have a, we do have a comment here. That's kind of interesting. Uh, somebody saying on Xing that in dentistry, the golden ratio is well known. Is it? Yeah. I mean, I assume it's being serious there. That's kind of interesting, but yeah, like that artists are not being, uh, taught that i mean of course you know the this all of the art schools have been completely infiltrated and all of the classical kind of understanding has been removed and replaced with uh every kind of you know demonic uh, affirmative action higher just whatever it's it's just a free for all of crazy degenerate stuff but the first time i actually heard of the golden ratio was when I was uh, reading your book a few years ago and I came across that and, and yeah, I know you and I, we actually did a previous discussion. Like that was like four years ago now, I think. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. About yeah. your book. But, uh, but yeah. anyway, yeah, I think it's great. And you know, you know, what we're trying to do here is just like, I've, I'm guessing that a whole bunch of artists just don't even know of these concepts or really kind of, a lot of people talk about Western art and, you know, this kind of thing, but like, it's really nice to try to kind of drill down to figure out like, what does that really mean? You know, what are, what are these, these values, like the symmetry, the balance, the harmony, you know, that stuff is, uh, it's really important. And we, it's, you know, we got it. We got a secret. Yeah. It's, it's the key to actually doing it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, this is, uh, this is fantastic. Let me, let me check again, see if anybody got, I think like, this probably a lot of this kind of information is new for a lot of people. So I don't even know if they would probably know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, what question <laughs> I to ask? I, I recommend everybody check out Brendan's book, uh, over on what, what's the best way to find it, Brendan? Oh, it's just on the, you can search my name on Amazon and, uh, Brendan, Brendan Hurd or decline of Western art should come up. Cool. Or yeah. I can, you know, send you the link or whatever. Yeah, I highly recommend folks check out the uh, the entirety of the book. I'd say, okay, so he was saying this. Uh, well, there's not there's an audio book coming out soon. The guy's still working on it. I don't know. It should be soon. I don't, can't say when. Maybe next month. Maybe okay. another month after. Cool. You great. Say that. Yeah. Sorry. Come on. No, that's that's great. Uh, give, it, give it more legs with the audio version. Uh, yeah. So, so this guy was saying that uh, in cosmetic dentistry is like serious that the golden ratio is a thing, which makes sense, right? Because it's like people when they want their teeth to look nice of course they're wanting the symmetry of having a really nice smile and all that so yeah that makes sense that they would be utilizing that but it's funny that you know you know i've never heard of it you you would never really heard of it in art school and you know they're doing it in cosmetic dentistry so well mathematicians <laughs> know about it and people doing i don't know if it has engineering applications probably it does i don't know exactly yeah I, i'm not surprised like it has real applications like just that weird, like weird things, like I said, where the Fibonacci sequence it relates to like pine cones and uh, the the rate of way rabbits breed or something. <laughs> you know, it, it relates to odd uh, cr across the board things in life and evolution and uh, etc. So it's like a, it is. It's not just like an an airy fairy arty concept, right? You, you know, it's it's real. So artists should have it in mind and they should use it. And it's if they really want to do it properly and really go for a new creative branch to, to really do it for real. Uh, they should keep it in mind, I think. And not, and yeah. not just visual artists, musicians, uh, you know, all of them. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't mean to make it seem like a, a flighty, like just abstract concept. Like, like you said, it's like the, the oh, no, in, no. in nature, um, like a mathematical formula. So, okay. Speaking of the music or, so we do have a question over here. Okay. So Blackbird music is asking, how does it show in music? Can you learn to recognize it in music? Are there any obvious examples you'd recommend listening to? Well, the normal scales, I believe, that we would use and consider musical are already based, derived on it, as, as far as I know. So if you, and so like, 
this is the thing. Like I say, you should pay attention to it. You don't have to be a mathematician. I'm certainly not a mathematician. And I, uh, you know, you don't have to actually do the formulas and things. Like I said, with the photographers where they just roughly, I have an idea, keep keep your center off focus. If you can recognize pattern, if you have generally a creative person, someone's involved in music or something already has a kind of innate ability, instinctual ability to recognize patterns. It's all, it's all, it's patterns. Right. So, you know, you can sense them, put them together and know what you're doing instinctually, I think as well, but it's good to have knowledge. Uh, so this kind of contradicts what I was saying. We should know about it and study it, but you should, and it's good to have knowledge of it, I think as well and apply it like literally and, you know, just to learn as much as you can about it and keep it in mind. I just think it's something important that you should keep in mind and not just the math stuff and the, and the ratio stuff. What I was saying about the crossword, the idea of you want to create something new, nothing ever, uh, Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think ever, nothing ever creates itself out of a vacuum. So usually when you're doing something creative, you've got an idea that's based on something else and you mix it with something, another thing, and you create the new thing that way, which is like, the, like I said, the Fibonacci combination. The, you combine and combine and combine the previous with the next. And that's how things influence. That's how evolution works creatively and in real life, I guess. Um, it's just good to know that and keep it in mind. You're looking for two or at least two or three things, mix them together and you'll find something new. Because we need to find more novelty. We're lacking novelty right now. That's for sure. Because it's not allowed. You can't explore at your own. Um, I mean, you can privately, but there's, there needs to be more. There needs to be mass encouragement, mass understanding to to get another anything resembling a, an art resurgence. I would say. Yeah, I'm completely on board with that. Yes. Um, yeah, everything's kind of a replication of what what they know can make money because as you were saying the the merchant class yes running the arts is a big part of the problem is there there the curation that happens is mostly based off of profit margins so it 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 uh stifles any kind of real creativity um so hyreth says what does brendan think about the schumann resonance and the fact that standard Standard tuning is based on 440 hertz now. Any thoughts on that? Uh, no. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> is she trying to? She's trying to. She's trying to sabotage me with an advanced musical <laughs> question. But, but, but ask her. Ask her to explain what she's talking about. I, I, I yes. don't know what she's talking. About. Could you, uh, Hyreth? Could you clarify? I, you like mean? I'm. I'm. I'm an amateur musician, but I. Uh, <laughs> you is know. This, I don't know. I don't know. She's, 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 to... she's a pro. I'm not. I'm an amateur when it comes to music. <laughs> she's just trying to stump you just for fun that's what it is <laughs> um let's see what else we got so so uh charles farley over on youtube says the golden ratio is imperative in graphic design for finding proper proportion proper proportion yes um juge says i use the golden ratio in my pieces a lot it's a very useful composition aid yes um let's see so, uh, what else? The Fibonacci sequence is used in trading stock and commodity markets as well as astronomy. Is it's, it? Well, uh, yeah, that that's interesting. It's not patterns. The key is using the elements of design and principles of design. That's also Charles Farley over on YouTube. Uh, let's see if we got anything else here. <laughs> All right. Hyrus did not clarify. She's just busting our chops. And all right. Do you know what she's talking about? Is there? <laughs> well, I mean, I I just very vaguely know. Like, uh, I have a lot of pretty good amount of like musical education. I, that stuff, I'm not sure about. Like with the resonance and stuff, that goes beyond my beyond my expertise for sure. Um, I know, I know what the, I've heard of those things, but I don't know what, I don't have any idea how to answer that question, <laughs> but, um, well, yeah, you all, got right. Us. You got us. all right. Yeah. I That's think, it. uh, I think we're good. We've, I think we've pretty much answered any questions and, uh, comments, concerns. Uh, thank you again so much for coming on to do this. I think it was fascinating and I would love to have you come on and do another part if you would like to. I know you came up to a couple parts that you're like, you know, that's a totally different lecture. Like, yeah, I would love to have you back on to uh, to expound on those parts as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great. No problem. Cool. Be happy to. Thanks right. for asking me. And thanks. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for all that. Yeah. 
And um, yeah, you guys, you should check out Brendan's book uh, over on Amazon. You can search Brendan Hurd or look up The Decline and Fall of Western Art. He's also got a science fiction book called The Dream God. You can check that out as well. And are you, or do you have something coming out soon? Another yeah, there's another science fiction compilation thing coming out. Um, I just got the uh, proof copy and there's a lot of stuff I need to change. So it's going to take a bit longer than I thought to finish. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, it's coming out soon as well. Cool. Well, we'll keep an eye out for that. And uh, I'd encourage everybody, uh, go over to the White Art Collective support page. And if there's any way you could help us out and support what we're doing, we're trying to really expand the educational portion of what we're doing, because I think that's critical. Just like with what we've talked about here, I think these are ideas that need to be reinfused back into the art community. And uh, we need to give, you know, try to try to boost the people who are writing about it and thinking about it and who uh, just like uh, Mr. Hurd and other folks as well. So, uh, yeah, check us out, whitercollective.com forward slash support. And I greatly appreciate everybody watching. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Yeah, have a good one.